Welcome to the CEC Report for the 24th of November 2017. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is CEC Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome Robert. Thanks Elisa. And on today's show we have Bail-in is crushing Europe but we can stop it here and why Australia wants Trump to go to war with China. So firstly, bail-in is crushing Europe but we can stop it here. Now there are real dramatic shifts taking place in uh, Australian politics at the moment and our campaign to stop new powers being handed to the Australian banking regulator APRA is a key part of that transformation which we'll map out in this segment. Um, just to explain, bail-in is a power that has been provided in various countries across the globe uh, where if a bank crashes, depositors' money, in some cases uh, certain kinds of bonds can all be uh, taken in order to keep the bank solvent yep. and trading. Um, now there is actually a new and major push in Europe right now for these global uh, bail-in powers, which we'll talk about later, where they're even wanting now to take the, the government guaranteed deposits below certain amounts that are usually meant to be rock solid. Um, now the point is though, we stopped bail-in laws coming to Australia in 2014 and we even delayed the global campaign to bring bail-in laws uh, across the board globally so there was a certain standard that could be followed worldwide for cross-border resolutions. We stopped it and delayed it for a year in 2014. We'll come back to the details of that in a moment. So the point is we can do it yep. again today. But we can do it if people get involved, right? And you know, to every viewer, we're going to ask you to do something, do it. Please do it. Um, what happened, this is not one of those times when you give up on the political system and say, ah, uh, you know, one person can't make a difference. One person can make a difference because you'll, whatever you do as one person is going to be copied by thousands of people. And what politicians recognise is when there's a community mood about something, right? Whatever stripe they are, the politician are, they can say, oh, something big's happening here. And the thing with this bill, the, what, what, our strength with this particular bill is it's being the people who prepared it sold it to the politicians as oh this is just minor details minor technical details don't worry about it well if that was true they would not be getting flooded with letters from the public about the potential of this bill that's the power you have but you've got to make sure you actually do it so please make a submission we're going to put some details on the board now and just to backtrack for one moment for those that aren't regular viewers the submission is See, this um, bill could have been voted up in the next session of yeah. Parliament. However, we kicked up enough of a stink about it that it was referred to a Senate committee. So it has to pass that committee before it can now go to the General House. That's the big breakthrough we've had, this, this, the fact that it's been referred to a Senate committee. And up until the 18th of December, anybody can make a submission uh, putting forward their concerns yeah. about the bill. So now what we'll give the instructions in is how to make such a submission. Okay, so what you need to do is write a letter to the Senate committee. Now the Senate committee, um, uh, realising that they're going to be inundated with a lot of letters, called me this week to say, can you please ask people to uh, make a submission through the formal online submission process. Now I'm going to put that up on the board but they had a big butt on the end. But this, the website you can look at if you want to do it online is www.aph.gov.au parliamentary underscore business forward slash committees forward slash online submission. You can go there and make a submission through that procedure. But it can get, if, it, if you feel it's complicated, don't sweat, don't make a submission that way. What we're asking people to do now, if you're watching this, it's the 24th of November, if you're watching this any time between now and the 10th of December, uh, write a letter. Write a letter to the Senate committee and it would be even better if you can like physically mail it. The, the reason you can't do it after the 10th, it won't get there by the 18th, right? So don't do it after the 18th, use an email. But if you can do it before then, and I'm saying do it now as soon as you watch this, write a letter to Senate Standing Committees on Economics, PO Box 6100, Parliament House, Canberra, ACT 2600, 2600. The alternative is send an email. And the email should be sent to economics.sen at 
aph.gov.au. We'll repeat those on the screen at the end of the show. But just make, and it doesn't matter what you say, a one sentence letter, a 10 page letter, whatever you wanna do, if you, if, you, if you feel you're confident in the subject, say what you think about everything to do with this APRA bill. If you just wanna say, look, what I know about this APRA bill is bad, we need Glass-Steagall instead, just say that. Mm. What's gonna get across to these people is if they start getting lots and lots and lots and lots of letters. Because just quickly, Elisa, when the Treasury did a, submis a submission proposed pr uh, process on this um, a few months ago, they got five or six submissions from industry groups and 250 from the public that we that we organised, and that was just in a, in a mm. week or so, mm -hmm. right? Um, they're going to get the same five or six submissions from the usual suspects. We want them to be flooded from the public. That's what you can do. And the key thing is that this legislation, the way that it's written, allows too much scope for APRA to be completely unmonitored and to, you know, to change what they consider to be the definition of capital that can be bailed in. Yes, we know that this bill will let APRA bail in these things called hybrid securities or bail in bonds that hundreds of thousands of probably self-funded retirees and self-managed super people have bought, not knowing they can become worthless overnight. We know that they allow that. We suspect the law, the wording of the law is so sweeping that in the future they'll be able to say, oh, deposits are capital and we can grab that for conversion or write-off is the words they use, conversion or write-off, just to keep banks going. Mm. We know that, right? So this is alarming act on it. Now the other breakthrough that we had this week is that finally one of the mainstream media outlets, the Australian Financial Review, actually covered this uh, and they had an article, we'll put it up, APRA's financial crisis powers attacked by fringe. Now since when did you have a fringe? <laughs> Robert? They call, they're calling us a fringe, but they quote <laughs> because me. They what quoted fringe? you saying Australians would revolt against any regime that confiscates their savings. But the other interesting thing is they gave us full credit yep. for the fact that this was referred to committee. Uh, they said that the referral to committee came after the Citizens Electoral Council, which has been campaigning for many years on protecting depositors from regulatory bail-in, began contacting MPs in recent weeks to express concerns about whether the bill could compromise depositors' rights. Uh, and there's quite a bit more detail about the worries of this bill. And even at the end, uh, the author, James Ayres, goes into a bit of detail on our other policies, such as the alternative to bail-in, which is preventing banks from actually gambling, which causes these problems of insolvency in yep. the first place, namely Glass-Steagall legislation, uh, and also the proposal for a national bank. Uh, and the, um, the editorial that came uh, in this package of the AFR the same day said, had the headline, Conspiracy Theories Drive Bank Inquiry, which is the other thing we want to talk about, because they pointed, as many other media outlets have said, to the fact that uh, Turnbull has been talking about delaying the session of uh, Parliament, Parliament so that he could avoid any um, vote for a banking inquiry, which 10 members of his party are now supporting uh, because it would amount to a vote of no confidence and could precipitate Turn an election. Turnbull hasn't said that, but they've, even the Fin Review have said that's what he's done. And there's been leaks from Cabinet that's confirmed that exact, that's exactly what he's done. Mm -hmm. um, and the talk of a banking inquiry is making people quite nervous because there, there are the numbers to get it through the Senate very clearly of a, a, a grouping that has come together of government MPs, Greens, Labor and crossbenchers. Um, now, one article was by Robert Gottliebson in The Australian, headlined, Quasi-Nationalisation of Banks is Too Dangerous. And what, what Gottliebson does is just start off with something very bizarre. He said, if former Prime Minister Ben Chifley were alive today, his heroes would be Treasurer Scott Morrison and APRA Chairman Wayne Byers. <laughs> Sorry, Scott, um, Robert Gottliebson, that is not true <laughs> at all. He's basically going into defence, bat for the banks from even uh, APRA, the stuff that they say APRA uh, wants to do to make sure the banks are secure, which is actually not true. Um, what he's re it, it's, it's not so much what he says, it's, the, it's he reflects just a growing um, hysteria out there in financial circles that things are slipping out of control here, mm. right? And so the, the rage in the public is such that APRA is trying to be, to be seen to be doing certain things in one area and that's that, that the banks aren't liking that. And on the other hand, you've got what we're accusing of APRA of really doing and they don't like the fact that that's out in the public either. Mm. And the banks are obviously really worried about this too because, as we'll show, this is one of the bank ads from the Australian Banking Association that are playing on TV at the moment. 
Hi, I'm Gracie and I've worked for an Australian bank for 32 years. It's always been for me the customer. What a lot of people don't know is that nearly 80% of uh, bank profits go straight back to shareholders. And not just big wink investors. It goes to millions of everyday Australians who own bank shares through their super funds. Profits don't belong to the banks, they belong to everyday Australians like you. Australian bank profits belong to Australians. Australian banks belong to you. They do, of course they do. Authorised by TPs in Sydney. Now, what you have there, Elisa, is desperation by the banks. Just, that's just pure propaganda. It's also extortion, right? Oh, you don't, up, you don't want the banks to be upset because your super depends on us, right? We have to rob you on a day-by-day -day -day basis so you can have super money in your super for when you retire, right? That's the, that's the message. And, of course, it's authorised by a character, Tony Pearson from the Bankers Association, who I personally had a run-in in, in Joe Hockey's office back in 2014. Um, and this is, you know, they're not very nice people, that's all I'd say about it. And this is the kind of propaganda mm. they're resorting to. And note also that also in your super are not just bank shares, but some of these bail-in bonds as well, most likely, you might not even know. Now, the other comment came from uh, John Howard last night, who said that this push for a banking inquiry is rank socialism. Yeah. <laughs> and, John, and what this guy, the, I mean, he sort of sums it up, right? John Howard is one of the arch neoliberals that have turned Australia into the mess it's become, right? And of course, he doesn't want to claim uh, credit for that. But he's speaking purely on behalf of the banks. This is He's a senior figure in the Liberal Party, which is owned by the banks. This is why he's saying it. And what he expressed real concern about is if you, even a Royal Commission, even though they can try and rig it, even that can spin out of control and all sorts of things mm. can come to the fore that will just really discredit the banks. And he's trying to desperately say, you know, reinforce Malcolm Turnbull's opposition to a banking inquiry. Now, we've got to stop briefly, but we'll keep talking about this subject right after the break. Welcome back to the CEC Report where we're discussing how we can stop bail-in in Australia which is quite crucial because there's a big escalation underway in Europe which we'll talk about now uh, to make it even worse than what it already is. Um, most, well all of the European countries uh, have a bail-in regime across the totality. It's an EU law. Yeah, the Banking Recovery and Resolution Directive which has been in place for since early 2016. Um, and this is the thing, after 2014, um, we stopped it, we actually stopped it in 2014 from getting into the G20. It was held off for a year, but whilst it was accepted in 2015 um, by the G20, Australia still hasn't got bail-in laws, whereas most other G20 jurisdictions, including the United States and New Zealand and other countries, have. So we've held back the tide on it going full hog so that it can be used in a cross-border way across the entire globe. Um, now, what we've shown in this week's Australian Alert Service is how this has been a complete failure in places like Europe that have fully implemented bail-in. And you can call us to get a free copy of the alert service if you haven't already to read the full details because they're rather shocking. Obviously, the test case was Cyprus in 2013 uh, and then it was declared that this would be the model. The, the template for the all of um, But in every case, uh, in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, in Austria, where it has been used, it hasn't worked to actually keep the bank going. They've had to also use bailout in tandem with bail-in. And that's the fraud of it all, because this was promised to the public. Bail-in was, it was such rage at the bailouts of banks in 2008, right? Taxpayer bailouts. These bankers cooked up this thing where we said, okay, no more bailouts. Yeah. We will bail in the banks. And people didn't realise the fine print mean that meant their savings. And when it's happened though, you've had these bail-ins wiped out thousands of small savers at a mm. time, but then they've had to come up with a bail-in as well, bail-out mm. as well. Why? Because when you're dealing with derivatives, Elisa, which is what is the big issue here, there's 1.2 quadrillion globally of these things. The banks are, that's where their losses are coming from. There's not enough money in any bank mm -hmm. to cover those losses, right? And so that's, that's the situation. I want to point out with Italy, that this is for Australian viewers, when they did the food, these bail-ins in Italy in 2015 of these smaller banks, these four small banks that went in, the people that were bailed in, you'll read in the news they were bondholders, right? They were glorified depositors is the truth. They'd been talked, the banks said to them, look, you've got deposits with us, put your deposit in, put your money. They thought they were putting in a different kind of deposit, right? And it was technically a bond. And when the, when the, um, the banks hit the dust and they were bailed in, the, all that money, which was their savings, got completely wiped mm. out, right? And that's the fraud here. 
the, gov the politicians are going to say to you, oh, this doesn't involve deposits. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Mm. But even with even putting that aside, the bonds that people are exposed to through their super funds that you were talking about, these hybrid securities, are going to be devastating for people when they get bailed in. Mm. And people in Italy suicided over this because they lost their life savings. The economy has been wrecked by it. But another thing you can read in the alert service, actually, from what you were saying about derivatives, Derivatives experts designed this bail-in. Right. <laughs> it was from go to woe. It was all the derivatives traders and the derivatives associations that did it. So it's important to read. Now the latest is, as you said, um, it was always stated in Europe and other places that guaranteed deposits would never be touched. And Europe's guarantee is for a hundred thousand euros. Mm -hmm. So only only money over a hundred thousand euros gets bailed in. Is what they said. But what we've discovered in the last uh, couple of days is that the European Central Bank has put out a paper which is proposing amendments to the Banking Recovery and Resolution Directive, the European bail-in regime, that will allow deposits under one hundred thousand euro to be taken, or so a percentage taken, or that they be frozen for five days, and that proposal could change, the original proposal was between five and 20 days, and that after that five days, people would only be allowed to withdraw a certain amount per day. And what they've said is that this explicit, they've said explicitly, this has to change the guarantee. This, this, this replaces the guarantee, right? So in, to all intents and purposes, Europe's 100,000 euro guarantee will be gone. Mm -hmm. um, they'll replace it with, with, with a slightly different structure that's going to allow them to freeze money. And in the very next paragraph, Elisa, they said, however, this cannot apply to, they use acronyms, and this, is like, the, the, this cannot apply to CCPs. Well, we just happen to know what those kind of acronyms mean. They're called, that, that means central clear, um, counterparties, which means derivatives. Right, that explicitly, mm. this we're going to you know, this freeze on people's money for five days. We have to, but it won't apply to derivatives, mm. right? And this is it gives the game away. And in regard to um, taking, you know, your deposits, the average person's guaranteed deposits, they state in the paper um, that we expect these far-reaching powers to be exercised only in extreme circumstances. But like the APRA bill, that's what they always, that's what they have to say. But I, would, I just want to point out to Australians, you're, again, politicians are going to say to you, oh, don't worry, there's a $250,000 deposit guarantee in Australia. Well, there may be right now on paper that we've, we've shown how that can't work in the case of the big four banks. But putting that aside, these people, APRA is connected to these banking authorities in Europe. They, they're all in the orbit of the Bank for International Settlements, etc. APRA will, like them, um, they'll do this in stages, mm. right? And then at a certain point, they'll say, well, this... This, we can't let this guarantee get in the way of our ability yeah. to keep the banks stable as well. This is the global standard. Yeah. Now we've got to take a break again, but after this we'll come back and talk about the new foreign policy white paper. Welcome back to the CC Report. Why Australia wants Trump to go to war with China. So now we're discussing the new foreign policy white paper that Julie Bishop issued this week. Yeah, I think we should have called this Why on Earth Would Australia Want Trump to Go to War with <laughs> yeah, China? Exactly. Um, now, really, this is part of the Australian government, together with what is called the Anglo American Alliance, um, trying to hold back the tide which is a dramatic political change, really a revolution in some parts of the world, such as the UK, against the neoliberal order. So this white paper stresses um, that it is a defence of the rules-based liberal economic order. And of course, liberalism brought us all the policies such as deregulation, privatisation, um, that has destroyed you know, every country, and which is why people are revolting against it. They can see that it doesn't and work. China has made itself, taken itself from the poorest country in the world to now the, virtually the richest by yep. the policies that we all used to use before we went down the neoliberal path, yep. public investment and in infrastructure, etc. That's what's made it successful. And the, the neoliberals are just freaking out <laughs> and they're trying to turn, spin this into a a question of tension, geopolitical tension with China. Yeah, and, and Julie Bishop, right after Trump was elected and one of the first things he did was say, we're gonna reorganize, renegotiate NAFTA and he pulled out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, she said at that point that basically we have to redefine our foreign policy. Remember in March, they brought back every Australian diplomat from overseas, which was mm. really, really happens. 
um, to you know look at what the Australian foreign policy would be. So this is the result of that and trying to prevent Trump working with China, particularly on projects like the Belt and Road Initiative, is a major part of it. There's a security angle too, where there's a push for what's called the quadrilateral security dialogue between Australia, the US, Japan and India to try to encircle China militarily, with us, for example, playing a bigger role in freedom of navigation exercises in the South China Sea, so pushing against China in that way. Um, and Bishop, Julie Bishop said um, in talking about this paper in The Australian this week, we want to work with like-minded democracies to shape China. Now you can imagine if China said something like that about wanting to shape Australia, yeah, yeah. How the rea what the reaction would be. Uh, forget Russiagate in America. I mean, there already there are already people in Australia trying to build up this type of idea. China's doing a Russian-style interference in Australia. Yet we're openly so it's all right if we do it to them, right? That's mm. the how we and see things. The other notable thing about this foreign policy paper is there's only one reference to the Belt and Road Initiative, and it's very brief. It basically says, "Oh, we'll work with BRI projects uh, if and when dot 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 on these conditions." Uh, and they also put in there, which has come up previously, that Australian financial institutions have, you know, all this experience and know-how on the rules-based order and how things should be financed without accruing massive debt through public-private partnerships, the old liberal methods. Yeah. I think the main thing with this paper, Lisa, that the viewers have to understand is it bells the cat about how the, the political dynamic between Australia and the United States really works. Most Australians, like a lot of people in Britain, etc., they tend to think that we are sort of like a, um, a, a, a colony. We function as a colony of America. We just, we just live, ex exist to serve American um, interests, right? That's how we've adopted ourselves, adapted to. Here's, we have a president in America now who wants to change the way things have been done. So he prefers to do these bilateral treaties one-on-one -on -one, instead of these big multilateral forums which, where everyone has to adopt this neoliberal stuff. And He's getting on with the president of China famously, like a house on fire, right? So what's Australia doing? We have put out a, pol pol a policy where we're saying, no, 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 we want to coax Trump into going back to the old way that was full of tension. We need him to be sending battleships and aircraft carriers in the South China Sea. We have to say to Trump, we need you to do this for us. What on earth? This is garbage, right? China's our number one trading partner. Who, what planet are we on when we're thinking this? But we are trying to... We are openly saying we need Trump to go back to what things were like before. And when we're doing this, we're not being Australians. We're certainly not being pro-America. We are being, we are acting with a British mindset. I want to read you a quote because a lot of Americans have adopted an imperial mindset like the British, but there's a lot who haven't. And America started off against the British. Quickly, Roosevelt in 1943 had a fight with Winston Churchill. And he said to Churchill, this is the quote, you have 400 years of acquisitive instinct in your blood and you just don't understand how a country might not want to acquire land somewhere else if it can get it. In other words, you, Winston, accuse every other country in the world of imperial motives that are British motives. And that's what's happening now. We're saying, we're, we're, we're accusing China of an outlook that is actually our outlook, that's actually British's outlook. And you've got a new president in America, he wants to change it. And we're determined he's going to stick to our imperial ways. That's the issue here. Yep. Now, lest we distract you from the task at hand by all of that, remember, write your letter to the um, Senate inquiry. Put the, 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 let, the address for the mailed letters on the board and the on the screen there and your, and your email. So write a physical letter or send an email. Yep, and make sure you get it done in the next couple of days. So we thanks, can win this. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Robert. Join us again next week.